Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Advanced Resources Thought Leadership Event on tackling the manufacturing industry talent shortage. My name is Nick Trowbridge. I am the managing director of our search practice here at Advanced Resources, and I will be moderating the, today's session uh, with our two fantastic panels here. So I would like to uh, remind everyone that all participants will be muted during this time and to please use the Q&A function throughout the session to submit your questions for our panelists, and we'll do our best to have those uh, answered at the end. Uh, also, after the event, you will be directed to a short uh, three-question survey to provide your feedback. So those of you who are unfamiliar with advanced resources, uh, we do partner with leading organizations to optimize their supply chain, driving optimal results by providing the resources they need to overcome business challenges. Uh, our subject matter experts specialize in the areas of strategic planning, risk and compliance, data analytics, and functional support. So today's conversation is a good one, um, a very uh, hot topic that we've, uh, I know many have been um, hearing, uh, you know, around, especially within uh, all types of manufacturing industries. And U.S. manufacturing uh, is expected to have 2.1 million unfilled jobs by 2030. So attracting and retaining workers is harder than ever. Uh, according to manufacturing executives, not filling jobs is an impact on several things, including maintaining production levels, responding to new market opportunities, supporting new production development and innovation, and implementing new technologies. So today's discussion, uh, what we're gonna really focus on is the challenges and the opportunities of the manufacturing industry talent shortage, including returning to work, automation, and an evolving workforce. So now I'd like to introduce our two panelists for today's conversation. We have Matt Bellavo, who is Chief Human Resources Officer from Sarah Lee Frozen Bakery, and Laura Burke, Vice President of Human Resources for Barilla America. So Laura, uh, if you'd like to kind of kick things off, we'd love to learn a little bit more uh, about yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Sarah, and everyone in advance for having me today. I'm excited to learn from you and Matt and everyone um, in our discussion today. So as Nick mentioned, my name is Laura Burke. Um, I work for Barilla, the world's largest pasta manufacturer. I hope you all are consumers and enjoy our products. I know this past year it's been in high demand because it's a safe, affordable product that you can have at home and feed your family. So thank you all for that. Um, we have two manufacturing plants in the US. So that'll be primarily my focus today. We do have a plant in Mexico um, as well that I'm responsible for. So my, my purview is North and South America. We have operations in Canada, US, Mexico, and Brazil. We just acquired a plant in Canada. So I can give a little bit of insight there if there's North America questions, but that's a new acquisition for us. Um, and we're just delighted to be here today. I think it's an important topic for all of us to tackle together. Great. Thank you so much, Laura. And Matt. Hi, good morning. Uh, again, uh, Matt Bellavo, Chief HR Officer for War Sara Lee Frozen Bakery, uh, and Nick and the advanced team, thank you for having us today. I'm looking forward to the uh, discussion with Laura, as I know this is a topic that is near and dear to the hearts of uh, everyone on this call. Uh, hopefully, you're familiar with uh, the Sara Lee brand, because it's been around for over 70 years, uh, but we are actually a pretty uh, young company as Sara Lee Frozen Bakery. We were formed three years ago when we were spun out of Tyson Foods and purchased by a private equity group called Colbert and Company, who owns us today. Uh, I came on board uh, just a couple of weeks after the, uh, the spinoff. So I've been here for, for most of the journey. Uh, we've got about 1,700 employees, uh, primarily in the US, some in Canada. We have four manufacturing uh, facilities uh, across the US, and we are predominantly uh, a North American business. So I'll be talking about the talent shortage and the things we're facing uh, from that perspective, similar uh, to Laura as well. So looking forward to a good discussion. Fantastic. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Laura. And, um, you know, great. Thank you. Both of you are very excited to have you both of you here. And, um, yeah, really looking forward to this discussion. So today, uh, what we like to do is just go through several questions uh, with Matt and Laura around this trending subject. Uh, and at the end of our call, I will address any questions, like I mentioned, that were submitted through uh, our Q&A function. So to kind of kick things off, uh, we'll have to get started here. And I'd like to ask both Matt and Laura this question. So what do you see causing the hiring demand 
uh, in general? I mean, is it a reflection of increased customer demand? Uh, is it strained supply chains? Is it you know different demands in general, a talent shortage, or is it uh, really you know a combination of these factors? Yeah, I'll take that one first, Nick. You know, for us, it's a variety of things. Um, you know, our hiring uh, needs and demand have certainly increased over the past year. It's been driven by um, increases in retirements, you know, from employees, as I'm sure many other employers on the call and Laura, you may have experienced too. Just, you know, people deciding that, you know, now is a good time to leave the workforce. Uh, if you were planning to retire a couple of years from now, we've people have accelerated that. Um, we've also had issues with retention where we have seen people either, I think, temporarily exit the workforce, you know, out of COVID uh, concerns and working in a manufacturing environment, despite the fact that, you know, we have very robust uh, safety practices in our plants and, you know, keeping employees healthy and safe has been always been front and center for us, but more so the past 18 months. But despite that, I think, you know, you see a number of people just opting out of the workforce for a period of time. Um, you know, we have also uh, had challenges with retaining people, you know, it is not uncommon for someone to come in, work for, you know, 30, 60, 90 days, and then decide that they want to, you know, leave the workforce. And what we're mm -hmm. finding is that's caused by a number of things as we're talking to people as they leave, either they've decided they're really not ready to come back to work and want to sit on the sidelines and take advantage potentially of some of the, um, you know, government supplements that are available, you know, to them. Uh, in other cases, we've had some challenges based on customer demand that have created some choppiness, you know, in our scheduling in our facility. So we're not able to schedule people, you know, as consistently as we've liked, uh, or we would like to be able to. Uh, so that inconsistent work schedule is causing people to, in some cases, trade down for lower paying jobs, you know, but a more consistent schedule. Um, and it just feels like there, the uh, availability of labor in our markets for a variety of reasons is less than it was, you know, 18 months ago. So I think all of us on this call, if we have operations in a 20 or 30 mile radius of each other, we're all competing for a, a smaller pool of talent than we were a year or so ago. So those are my thoughts, but Laura, I'm sure you've got some things similar and probably some things different that you could share as well. Yeah, I mean, I think for for what we're seeing, I'm a working mom. Um, I sent my, uh, my last child off to high school this morning. So like, I think what people have done during the last 18 months is kind of assess where they're at. And am I at a COVID proof company? Like, mm -hmm. is my job stable? And I think the things that were important maybe 18 months ago are not as important as they are today. And I was sharing in the pre-discussion with Matt and Nick that, gosh, I've had more family dinners in the last 18 months with my kids than I had the prior 18 years because I was on the road a lot and like Matt. Um, and so I think people have just reassessed what's important to them during this time. And there's some things that they're willing to give up and there's some things they're not willing to give up. And so we haven't faced as much turnover challenge as Matt, although we're competing for the same talent, but I think we're preparing for the future and kind of this mm -hmm. notion of the great resignation, what's coming. And that really scares me because I think people are Watching one, was your company COVID proof? Did you survive? And did they, you know, have layoffs? Did they have to take pay cuts during the past? But also thinking about the future, if this happens again, or this continues to go on, what kind of flexibility am I going to have? Mm -hmm. And even our manufacturing environments, and Matt talked a little bit about scheduling. You know, we were 24-7, uh, four days, one week, three days the next. You work a 12-hour shift. It starts at 7 a.m. It starts at 7 p.m. And there was one time where we had 43 different start times because we had to flip the, the script and we had to say, okay, hourly employees, when can you work? What's going on at home with COVID? What's going on with, you know, your family situation? You've got childcare, kids aren't in school. Okay, forget the 7 a.m. Like, when can you come in? Mm -hmm. And the good news is we proved that we could be flexible during that time. And the challenge now is we know we can be flexible and the employees expect that. And so I'm really worried about, you know, people leaving without flexibility, even in the manufacturing and the sure. hourly environment. So that's really top of mind for us. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So obviously a, a total multitude of, of different things that, you know, is, is causing all this. And, and, and Laura, I can totally agree with you there. And, and the flexibility piece is, is recruiters and recruiting firm. It's, you know, one of the number one things we're hearing, you know, in the market uh, for people to, to take on new opportunities. So, uh, and, and 
we'll definitely agree with uh, having the more dinners uh, now than ever, right? Which is a, which is a great thing with with all these families. So um, fantastic, thank you. I want to jump into a different question here, um, and I, th I think it's very important, being that you are obviously both work for really large manufacturing organizations. But do you think that the talent shortage uh, impacts the products that your organization is is producing, right? So how does this affect your organization uh, and your strategies for for product based? organizations. So uh, Laura, I'd love to kind of hear your, your thoughts on that. It hasn't, it hasn't changed our products in terms of innovation of bringing new things to the market per se. Um, for us, we actually did the opposite. We did a, a reduction of SKUs and had to simplify our lineup just so that we could meet consumer demand. So really changing um, and maximizing our manufacturing capacity at the time, you know, and you guys all went to the grocery store, you know, the shelves were empty, pasta was empty. You couldn't, you couldn't find it. And yet with so much unknown, it was like people were stocking up. So mm -hmm. ours hasn't really brought innovation per se. I think now people are looking for more variety. They're looking for new things to try. Um, but at the time it really, we really reduced, um, you know, our SKU count to make sure that we could meet consumer demand and kind of pent up demand there. And we're still recovering. I mean, you, you hear it all the time. Supply chains are still recovering. Can't buy a used car if you're looking for one. Mm -hmm. um, and the same for us. I mean, we're still we're still um, battling that. And then we're battling new challenges like wildfires in California. All of our, our Durham wheat is, is out West mm -hmm. in the desert plains. And so there's just, it seems like it keeps piling on all of the challenges around um, scarce skills and, and, um, and meeting consumer demand. So you really have to take it day by day. Sure. Absolutely. Matt, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I would say similar to Laura, it's been an evolving issue for us, you know, over the past 18 months. You know, last year, what we were producing uh, was more impacted by customer demand than talent. About 50% of our business is food service. Mm -hmm. So last year's restaurants shut down, building cafeterias, um, university, school lunches, uh, things like that. Uh, that was driving uh, an impact more on what we were producing. Now, as that comes back, even though it's choppy uh, in terms of customer orders, we are seeing the talent shortage impact, you know, more of what we're able to produce. So a couple of examples, you know, one at, you know, one of our plants in Massachusetts, I have a, a, a certain a line that makes a specific type of product that we have been unable to fully staff a second shift. Mm -hmm. um, so we're only able to run one shift, you know, on that line, which is obviously impacting what we can, you know, send to customers. Uh, earlier this week, I spent a couple of days uh, at one of our sites in North Carolina, you know, our largest facility where, you know, we have just been uh, finished a, you know, a capital expansion project that cost tens of millions of dollars to service uh, a long term contract that we just put in place with one of our, our largest customers. And we're actually not able to, um, we, we're, we delayed the startup of that line and shifted mm -hmm. some of our manufacturing to uh, a co manufacturer who can make the same product that we're running on that line, because of the talent shortage we have at the plant rather than have people make, you know, muffins and, uh, excuse me, biscuits and croissants that we've set up this new line for. I need people to run pound cake. I need people to run muffins because we've seen a sudden spike uh, in orders uh, for both those products and it's pounds we need this year. Um, mm -hmm. So it has caused us to um, just, the, the talent shortage is causing us to change how we're manufacturing, which skews, and even shifting to more of a co-man strategy at times and do, having to do it in a really agile and quick way. Um, something that, you know, we thought we were kind of good at before, but, you know, I think this has forced us all to figure out how to be more, more nimble than we ever thought we, we could be. Sure. Sure. And almost market by market, Matt. I mean, yeah, you, you mentioned two separate markets, two separate manufacturing, but that's the, that's the real challenge is you can't come up with this uh, talent sourcing strategy, even, countrywide or company-wide, it's almost market by market. Ames, Iowa, we have under 2% unemployment rate and that what works there just won't work in upstate New York. And so I think that's-, that's You know, Laura, that is, that's a great point, you know, and, and kind of building on that, like using those two specific sites um, that I, I was uh, talking about, you actually just approved uh, a wage increase for all hourly positions at the bakery in Massachusetts yep. this week because uh, you know, we were finding that we were, despite having done wage increases last year, we were not keeping pace you know, with the local market. In North Carolina, our issue isn't wages. You know, we actually hear from people that they come to us because we're paying a better wage already mm -hmm. you know, to the employers in that area. But our, those scheduling issues that I talked about based mm -hmm. on 
you know, consumer demand and, and customer orders are creating a lot of variability, you know, in our schedules. And people are saying, you know, I'll stay here for a more consistent schedule, but I'll go somewhere else for less money mm-hmm. if I can get the consistency there. So trying to come up with, you know, a nationwide strategy to solve your talent issues, um, you know, is really, uh, it, it just feels really um, you know, not feasible right now. Yep. Absolutely. And I think you you know, brought up great points. It is, you know, kind of differs from, from market to market and from plant to plant, right? I mean, it's 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 going to you know fluctuate uh, in so many different areas, right? And I think I speak for most people that if you know if there's if there's issues with um you know Sarah Lee producing brownies and pound cakes and muffins, that's that's no one's gonna like that. Um and that's gonna be that's gonna <laughs> no. be an issue. Right? So, <laughs> it's gonna be a problem uh, <laughs> at my house. Yeah. Well, you know, as you're having more of those family dinners, hopefully that includes, you know, a little, you know, family dessert every now and then. Yeah, right. Again, for sure. We'll start with the pasta, we'll end with any of the Sara Lee po- uh, products. So yeah, perfect. Um no, thank you there. Uh another question that I thought was you know extremely important um is you know, we talk about different markets and in, 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 in different roles, but like, do you really, do you think there's a skills gap or a lack of talent within specific areas that you're, you know, now seeing more uh, than, than before prior to, to everything with the pandemic? Yeah. You know, Nick, I think, you know, and for certain uh, roles within manufacturing, we were talking about a skills gap, you know, even pre COVID mm-hmm. on the, uh, on the manufacturing side, you know, in, in the plants, you know, I feel like for at least, I don't know, the last 10 years, every plant leadership team I've talked to has said, you know, I can't find enough mechanics. I can't find enough skilled uh, trades positions just because those, you know, those people aren't out there. There's, you know, people that have been doing it for 30 or 40 years that are retiring and just the influx of people that are going into those, you know, jobs or career fields does not match the talent Mm -hmm. that is leaving. So I think that's been with us for a while. I think, you know, as, um, uh, you know, I heard someone say in the past year that, you know, COVID exposed everything that's working and not working, you know, within mm-hmm. organizations. So I think that the, um, the pandemic and the impact of it has just exacerbated some of the areas where we had a skills gap before. Mm-hmm. I have seen, though, that uh, on the professional or salaried side, you know, there are, you know, certain career fields that have just been in, you know, far more demand the past year. Um, and I don't know if it's a talent shortage or just that the demand is outstripping, you know, the supply, uh, but it's, I'm sure like most manufacturers on this call, your supply chain organizations, your procurement functions have been hyper-focused on mm-hmm. um, how do you increase efficiencies? How do you manage commodity costs? So anyone on the, you know, kind of systems process engineering uh, supply chain side, um, those people are in far more demand and procurement talent has been in uh, far more demand uh, than I've seen, um, you know, in, in years. Um, and I know, Laura, as we were talking about before the call, you knew you had expressed some, some similar uh, challenges, but I think that you had some, some others that were uh, maybe not, I wasn't feeling as acutely, but were mm-hmm. like, I think in the area of IT or cyber, maybe for yeah. you. Yeah, I think just to touch on maintenance, I think even maintenance isn't a maintenance anymore. You know, 30 years ago, what was maintenance was one thing, but both of our plants are very um, automated and, and highly technical. So even the skill within maintenance, you know, is a different kind of caliber. But one of the big areas that we're seeing, we just had a manufacturing plant that was shut down for two weeks in Mexico due to a cyber attack. Yeah, I mean, shut down. Mm -hmm. And there's no amount of supply chain people that you can do um, to bring that back up. I mean, it, it literally crippled us for two weeks and that's just lost revenue and becomes more of an insurance claim. And I think to your point, there's, um, especially in cyber, there is, everybody's looking for cyber help Mm -hmm. because, you know, all it takes is one and then you're in trouble and people will say, why didn't we have anybody focused on cyber? It's a very scarce skill in the market. So if you have kids in school, they're not sure what to do. I would advise them to look into cyber or IT because they can really command in the market starting salaries well above any other kind of entry level because they have a unique um, technical Mm know-how that is truly scarce in the market. So cyber is something that we're looking for right now. And um, we don't even really know exactly what what we're needing from them, but we know we need somebody that has an eye and a lens for cyber to try to avoid those really crippling um, business impacts and impairments that, that come through them, unfortunately. Absolutely. And it's, and it's crazy how they're completely two opposite, you know, we're talking about a talent shortage or whatever it might be. It's two opposite sides of the spectrum, right? That we both of you guys t- uh, really talked about. Um, so that's, that's extremely interesting, you know, to me and, and, and Laura, you know, I'll, I'll reiterate what you said for, for any 
uh, parents on this call that have, uh, you know, kids in college, remember anything that you go into cyber related, you have a really good chance of, of probably grabbing a job uh, right out of school. So if you can uh, take that away from the call, that'd be huge. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, this, uh, my next question kind of goes along with, you know, kind of uh, certain roles, right? Um, but uh, really centered around automation, right? So with a struggle to identify talent, as, as we've been talking about here today, um, are you accelerating automation um, to get your products out? And I know, uh, Matt, we had talked about this in the past. Uh, I'm kind of, you know, curious of what your thoughts are around that. Yeah, you know, automation is something that uh, we've certainly been spending more time talking about the last 18 months, and it's a combination of some talking and, and some doing. You know, when you're talking about going from a, a manual process to an automated one, you know, in a manufacturing environment, you know, oftentimes you're talking about a significant outlay uh, in terms of uh, capital expenditure dollars. So they're not, they tend not to be short term decisions. Um, but we have been uh, forced to react in, in some ways due to customer demand um, to invest in some automation. So one specific example, we make a lot of um, uh, muffins uh, for our food service uh, customers, uh, one of our sites. And you know, there's just been an increase in demand for individually wrapped product you know, over the past year. And I think that is one trend that is going to continue coming out of the pandemic. You know, prior to um, you know, COVID hitting, if you were to watch a, um, you know, like a, a four ounce muffin line uh, being packaged, there was, you'd see a lot of people picking muffins, you know, out of trays, placing them, you know, into uh, an auto wrappers that went down the line. We have fully automated, you know, most of that process at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and it was um, somewhat easier to go faster because the technology existed. Uh, so we didn't have to go create something. Um, and we were able, we were fortunately able to, you know, get a decent uh, lead time from a manufacturer uh, for the equipment. There are other areas that we would love to automate, um, but either the equipment doesn't exist, so it's got to be custom made, um, which takes time because you have the whole design process and then thinking about, you know, we're, we're a private equity owned firm, you know, I'm sure everyone's, you know, regardless of your ownership, you know, on this call, your, your executive team, your board of directors is focused on, um, you know, creating value. Mm -hmm. uh, but for us, the, uh, um, the pressure on creating value is, is fairly significant. So sometimes what seems like, hey, this is a great investment, it'll pay off in seven years. And that's not a great time horizon, necessarily sure. like in a PE environment. So again, using, a, you know, our site in North Carolina, for example, we make a fantastic uh, three layer uh, cake uh, food service product uh, that is phenomenal, uh, but it's all iced by hand, you know, so you oh, wow. got, you know, about 20 people on a line that they look like they're operating a pottery wheel. You take <laughs> them out, put on the line, frosting to pot. Yeah. And it, it, it looks easy. It's incredibly skilled. Like I tried it one time and my, my cake went flying like 20 <laughs> They sent me out of there. Um, that's something like we would love to automate, um, but the engineering challenges behind it, you know, prohibit us doing that right now. So short answer, yes, we are, we have done some more automation. I think that it is forcing some things that were long-term mm -hmm. decisions to be more midterm ones mm -hmm. um, and try and shorten our, our time horizon to do more of that. Matt, just a quick example. I mean, I think as a consumer, I just what you said about the prepackaged. So I love the lemon loaf at Starbucks. I don't know if that's your product or not, but before COVID you'd go through and they'd put it in this pretty, you know, artisanal bag and whatever. Then during COVID it came packaged. I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't even know this was, you know, individually wrapped. And now that's how I order it all the time because sure. it's just one less touch point. And, may, and maybe I don't want to eat it right away. Maybe I want to wait an hour and then eat it. And so I think you're right. I think consumer even need states changed as mm -hmm. a result of COVID of something that we didn't, know or think we needed before but but now we need it and so that innovation and automation is yeah you know it kind of pulls it through it kind of no for sure and, and and nick trying to go back to like the original point you know of your question not only are we you know looking at more automation just to you know gather the efficiencies behind it but i think we've realized that you know you're, you're always going to be somewhat people dependent you know in manufacturing sure. but i think some of the challenges that we're experiencing today they're not going to go away. You know, I think even, you know, post COVID as we look at the number of people who have, you know, potentially permanently left the workforce and then even as, you know, kind of the next generation uh, of workers enters the workforce, the likelihood of them, you know, going into hourly manufacturing jobs, maybe, you know, less, you know, than it was in the past. So I think that there is a talent reliance 
um, component to, to thinking about these decisions. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, a flip side of that coin too, because as you introduce more automation, you know, sure. you need more technically skilled people to maintain it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it still requires some level of operation. So there's, oh, e automation doesn't necessarily solve, you know, your sure. talent shortage issues. It can help address it, um, mm -hmm. but it is not. Uh, it solves not, one and creates another one, Matt, yes. I think. <laughs> Double-edged sword, right? Yeah. <laughs> No, absolutely. And, and, you know, I think you, you hit the nail on the head, like being people dependent, right. Talent reliant, right. These are very, very important. So that it kind of leads me uh, into it. My next question, let's talk about returning to the office, right. I mean, if we're people dependent, and this is obviously a very important uh, topic of what people have been doing here recently. And, and, you know, I know is, um, you know, here is, is recruiting firm, you know, it's, it's the number one thing that we talk about with, with candidates and, and things of that nature. So, you know, some companies have started bringing their, their corporate employees back, right. Where um, there have been concerns that that could really impact, uh, you know, retention at the end of the day. Right. So mm -hmm. can you share your kind of your approach of, of what your company uh, is doing right now? And Laura, do you maybe want to kick that one off? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, so first of all, I mentioned that our headquarters are in Chicago land area. Mm -hmm. So Illinois based. So I know we have a variety of, um, client partners on here that may be in other geographies as well. So just wanted to say like, all right, where are we? We're in Illinois. Our office opened up without restrictions this summer, but there was no expectation or mandate that employees came back. And it was really interesting. We had our first hybrid sales meeting um, a couple weeks ago. So that was kind of interesting. Um, and when we had the office open without restrictions, we had some people say, I got to get out of my house. Like I'm mm -hmm. in my bedroom today. I got to get out of my house. I got to get away from <laughs> kids. I got to get away from the spouse. I got to, I just need to get out of these same four walls. So we really used our office as kind of a safe haven for people who wanted a different place to think and collaborate and just um, have a different workspace. We originally had said we were going to return um, right after Labor Day in September. So as of today, we're sticking with the base plan, but that could change in you know 30 minutes, depending on what's happening with Delta and variants and things like that. So I'll tell you the current state. Um, today. So we are planning still to return in September. We've talked about pushing back um, that expectation to return. We're asking folks to come in 50% um, during the week. They can decide when. They're, a lot of them are doing it uh, at the team level. So marketing, they've picked Wednesday as a day where they, at least the, the first line, the top level, want to come in all in one day so that they can do more collaborative work or if they're doing tastings or if they want to do some more team building or, um, you know, things that are not independent thinking work. They can do that easily, you know, when they're working from home, but do those things in the office that are more difficult to do virtually. Sure. Um, so we're still planning on bringing them back. We um, are talking about, um, we haven't mandated vaccines. We're talking about asking for proof of vaccinations and or weekly tests like every other company that are probably assessing that right now. Um, but it's hard because you have a return to work um, policy and you want to put things in place and yet two-thirds of our workers are in the plant they're essential workers mm -hmm. they didn't have the luxury and so it is kind of you want to make sure that it's not this um, perception of two two different um, worlds within the company sure. because when our plant employees say oh they're complaining about going back to the office are you kidding me I never got to leave the plant right. so you know you have to balance that and yet at the same time safety is the most important as matt mentioned you've got all the, mm -hmm. the safety precautions in the plant and we know they work so how do we take the best of what we know works in our plant environment bring it to the office environment and yet Perfect. we're missing a little bit of the culture so we do believe there's value in, in folks getting back together safely absolutely absolutely yeah you know similar to Laura. Uh, we're also, you know, in the Chicago land area, our headquarters is in Oak Brook, um, but most of our employees are out in plant. So our corporate office is only about 150 people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, much like COVID has gone, you know, in waves over the last 18 months, you know, our return to the office uh, has gone in waves. Uh, we actually reopened our offices last August on a voluntary basis. Um, putting a number of safety precautions in place. We were wearing masks, but similar to Laura, you know, we had surveyed employees and heard the feedback of, you know, I need to get out of my house, or <laughs> even if it was just for one day a week, or even just some of the challenges with, you know, onboarding a new, you know, employee. You know, we'd have, mm -hmm. you know, people come in for their, you know, kind of a half first day. You know, my team would do some of the basic HR onboarding. IT would come and issue them, you know, a home setup. You know, they'd meet their manager, have a socially distanced lunch, you know, and then, you know, head back home to, <laughs> to meet their team virtually. Um, and we were, um, like I said, it wasn't, it was just optional for people to come back. I would say we were probably no more than 
25% occupancy most days. And that was mm -hmm. last uh, August through November is the winter surge hit. We went back to full remote mm -hmm. you know, for everyone. And then this past uh, April of this year with the, you know, as vaccines became more available, we went back to, you know, reopening the office again on a voluntary basis. And, you know, we have seen probably anywhere from 25 to 50% occupancy. Um, sure. and it's gotten more as time has gone by. What we communicated at the beginning of the summer to our employees, and it's still our plan as of today, though similar to Laura, you know, this is all <laughs> subject to, to change based on the whims of, of Delta and other things. Uh, but what we communicated to people at the beginning of the summer was uh, we were going to end the option of 100% remote work for corporate employees uh, after Labor Day. And that our expectation was that people come back to the office at least 50% of the time. And mm -hmm. again, almost exactly what Laura said, we've said, you know, we're not mandating which days you come in, uh, left it up to teams um, to see what makes, you know, the most sense for them. Um, mm -hmm. Again, employee safety being paramount through all of this, we're not mandating, you know, vaccines. I don't, I don't think we're gonna get there, at least not anytime uh, soon. Um, you know, but at the same time, you know, we have realized that while we've been able to run the company in a you know, fairly virtual environment you know, on the corporate side, um, it's not ideal. You know, I think that you know, what, one, of our, one of our values uh, that has guided our decision making from the beginning is this concept of like we get to yes together and we realize it is easier to get to yes and that we are better when we are physically you know, together. There is this level of informal productivity mm -hmm. that happens when you're in the office and our, we've all felt our relationships in this you know, kind of virtual you know, Zoom or Teams environment have become more transactional. And that makes us less effective, mm -hmm. you know, as sure. an organization. Yeah, man. And I don't know, you just sparked something um, about the relationship side. I think, you know, you had relationship capital with your employees before going out on COVID. You knew them. They knew you. They knew you cared about them. Think about our new hires that have joined us in the last 18 months. Some of some of ours have never been to our location. They they joined us sight right. unseen. You know, it was kind yeah. of a, a screen um, acceptance and everything we promised them, but some of them haven't even been in our office. And I just don't have that relational credit in mm -hmm. the bank with those employees. And that's really what we're trying to avoid long-term. So I think that credits proved us well thus far. I think it probably has a little more runway in it, but at some point, you know, let's ask those new hires, do they feel really emotionally connected to the company or relationally mm -hmm. connected to their team? And they just didn't have that credit in the bank to go off of. I can't imagine starting a new job during, during the pandemic remotely. I think it's probably been super tough on them. You know, it has been hard. And it's, you know, from a retention and engagement standpoint, you know, it has forced, you know, my team and I to, to work harder about, okay, we've, we've worked really hard to get someone to join our company, mm -hmm. you know, during the, the COVID pandemic. And for many of them, yeah, what you just described, you know, it's been that virtual experience you know, how do you make sure that, you know, you build those relationships? So, you know, pre-pandemic, you know, my CEO and I would have lunch with a small group of employees, you know, every month. Um, we kept that practice up during the pandemic, even though it became, you know, virtual most of the time. Um, I would typically have um, coffee with every new hire mm -hmm. the first 30 or 45 days. You know, I've continued that you know, during the pandemic, but it is not quite the same in this transactional way. Sure. Um, and just the, you know, the experience of getting back together in the office, I was, uh, had run and ran into our R&D director uh, this morning, who was telling me that um, earlier this week, the, uh, and her team has grown uh, during the pandemic, for the first time since last March, she actually had her full team together uh, in our R&D center, you know, mm -hmm. for a day. Um, and it felt like a novelty. Yeah. And, you know, that, you know, we can kind of joke about that. But to your point, like, what have we, I think we're going to find as more people come back to the office, we didn't realize how much we were missing. And I'm hoping yeah. that that drives, you know, some level, you know, of engagement. And I think it'll also be interesting to see, and I'm sure there's some employers, you know, on the call who are, you know, maybe looking at continuing the option of, you know, 100% fully remote. And what are the, the cultural implications? What are the talent attraction and retention, you know, implications of, you know, how you choose to operate as a company in a hybrid or, you know, kind of fully immersed at least a couple of days a week, you know, environment. I think that, that that's going to be one of the things that continues to, 
you know, echoes down, echo down the hallways of the future as yeah. we move past COVID. I think it's going to be this tipping point between providing value when we get together that overweighs the commute. You know, that's really, right. that's really the tension point is nobody wants the commute. I don't want the commute either. I like, <laughs> right, you know, right. I mean, I, I have zippered pants on today. You guys can't tell, but you know, do I have to wear <laughs> zippered pants when I go in? No, but I think so employees don't want to go in because they know what they're giving up, but hopefully they're going to gain something on the flip side of that, that adds value to the experience um, that outweighs that. And yet we heard the same thing from our sales group last week. They didn't know how much they needed it mm -hmm. until they had mm -hmm. it. And they're like, wow, I have missed this. I don't want to do it every day, which we weren't five days a week pre-pandemic. <laughs> mm -hmm. They don't want to do it every day, but they felt value. And I'm sure your R&D team, they left energized. And that energy and that um, that passion is something that's very hard to get through a screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And we can we can get to yes together. I'm I'm stealing that, Matt. I'm just letting you know right now. So hopefully it's I not trademark. I might yeah, do it. Maybe on my employer value proposition. I'm coming after coming after absolutely. you. Now. Absolutely. No, there's there's I absolutely true, you know, value in, in, in having people, you know, uh together, you know, uh, outside and or you know, back in in uh in the office rather than being remote. Um like you said, it's maybe not all the time for some, but you know, uh, absolutely true uh, value in that area. So I do want to shift gears from the uh, remote working to another very uh, important uh, topic, and that is, you know, uh, anything around uh, diversity and inclusion. So, uh, Laura, um, I'm curious to, to see really what what has your organization done uh, to strengthen any of your DNI initiatives at this point? Yeah, I mean, I think it would have been too easy during COVID, as Matt mentioned. If you're looking for talent, you're looking for any talent. I think it would have been too easy during COVID just to say, let's put a pause on our DNI efforts. And when we get through COVID, we'll bring them back. Sure. And we just strategically chose not to do that. Mm -hmm. um, we said now more than ever, especially when we see um, COVID hitting, you know, our communities of color, the worst, we're seeing um, vaccination rates low, we're seeing unemployment higher amongst those same communities. We said, this is not the time to abandon what we really believe is a value of ours. And so we almost doubled down on it, to be honest with you, Nick. And so my team still has the same target they had pre-COVID, which is to okay. present a diverse slate of candidates every job, every job. Okay. And it's not a race. You know, we're going to outlast this thing. And I want to make sure we get the best talent, but I'm not going to sacrifice making sure what is important to us for, for, um, for speed. And what's interesting is we've done a lot for our hiring managers around unconscious bias and skill building in that area. And they've really stepped up. And when you present a diverse slate of candidates, you expect them to pick the most qualified candidate and they do. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, last year we hired 55% um, of our employees that we hired were non-white. That was not an accident. They're super talented. They got the job based on their performance and their merit. And hiring managers have really stepped up and said, mm -hmm. you know, this does make our team better. Um, in our manufacturing environment, Ames, we're about 80% male. In our upstate New York plant, we're 90% male. So gender representation is important to us. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it can be a challenge. We've got a lot of working moms and we've got to think through the challenges that they face and why they might want to join us as an employer. And so we're, we're not giving up on those because we really do believe representation matters. It, it takes a little extra effort sure. and work, but we think it pays off in the back end. Sure, absolutely. Matt, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, similar to Laura, I mean, we had been uh, certainly focused on, you know, DNI pre-COVID. I mean, one of the the opportunities we had as we were starting up the company was, you know, we pretty much didn't um, had to hire an entire corporate staff as when the business was spun out of Tyson. It was just the manufacturing side, no corporate or functional support employees. So from day one, um, you know, my CEO and I aligned on a mandate of a diverse slate of candidates for for every job. Um, so from a corporate standpoint. You know, we had that practice in place and we continued it uh, during COVID. Um, I'd say a little bit, uh, you know, different rather than uh, just focusing on hiring. We also focused on how do we engage uh, and drive retention, you know, of the diverse group of employees, you know, that we've had, you know, during the pandemic. So in the, the wake of, you know, last year's events uh, around the George Floyd murder and the social unrest that came from that, you know, out of um, some listening sessions we had with employees, we actually created our first uh, employee resource group uh, mm -hmm. to support uh, employee needs, you know, in that space. And some of the things that we have done are to find developmental opportunities mm -hmm. uh, to advance the uh, leadership development uh, of people of color within the organization and partnered with some outside firms to do that. 
We've also looked at leveraging our strengths as an organization uh, and serving um, or focusing on how do we serve um, communities of color um, and food uh, scarcity needs uh, that they have and increasing our uh, partnership with Feeding America. While not directly related to talent shortage, being able to talk about uh, things that are important to, we know are important to employees and show that we are committed to taking action as a company to drive engagement, to drive retention, um, so that we're not you know, losing the diverse group of employees that we've worked so hard uh, to bring into the, the organization. Fantastic, fantastic. No, thank you. That's, I mean, that's obviously a very, very important, I know it's uh, in kind of prior conversations, very uh, kind of near to everybody's heart, both of your hearts, you know, uh, in, in what you're doing here and, and trying to accomplish. And, you know, another thing that I, I wanted to kind of bring up and especially uh, with myself and my team and, and we're talking with um, candidates uh, here in the market right now is, is really different areas around compensation, right? So uh, very uh, important to, you know, a lot of people is maybe not as much to, to others like we talked about, maybe commute or other things that will factor into people deciding to make a move. But I'm curious, um, Matt, you know, what, what are you doing right now with compensation to, to really attract the, the best talent in, a, in a obviously very tight candidate market, right? Yeah, I, it's definitely a, a candidate's uh, market right now. And I think Absolutely. that, you know, Nick, I know you know this, and I'm sure the rest yeah. of us on the call have experienced it, but, you know, it costs more to get the same level of talent today than it did 12 or 18 months ago. And it's not yeah. because there's been, you know, a little bit of what I'll call like normal, you know, wage inflation, you know, during that mm -hmm. period of time. Uh, it really feels like there's just been you know, an escalation of, you know, what does it take to land someone? Uh, and really, it, I think all levels of the, you know, the hourly to, you know, salaried or more professional uh, ends of the spectrum. You know, it feels like the de facto minimum wage in the United States is $15 an hour. Mm -hmm. you know, right now, not, you know, seven twenty-five or whatever is, you know, on the federal books, it's, it's really 15 Mm -hmm. um, uh, so on the, the manufacturing hourly side, definitely a lot of pressure to um, from compensation, as I was saying earlier, you know, we've just, you know, raised uh, wages um, for like the more than we normally would sure. on an annual basis, uh, you know, at some of our sites on the uh, salary side, you know, I'm finding that um, not only do you have to pay more to get talent in the door, you know, all of our people are getting calls, you know, all the time about, you know, sure. um, you know, uh, different job opportunities, people getting passive candidates getting poached away. So, you know, it has forced us more to take a look at our current group of employees and say, like, hey, are we, are we compensating people fairly? Do we have, and, and we're obviously always focused on that. And I say fairly, it's not an internal equity thing. It's in comparison to how the market, you know, has shifted. And if someone got a three and a half percent you know, merit increase this past year, then they might be, you know, not, um, uh, keeping pace, you know, with the markets. We have had to go and do, you know, some one-off salary adjustments for our, you know, higher potential or critical to retain talent, mm -hmm. to have the reinforcing message of like, you're valued, you know, you have, um, you know, we, we, we see what you contribute to the organization, you know, please don't go somewhere else. Sure, right. Uh, the compensation is not just about, you know, how do we get uh, people in the door? It's, it's how do we keep people uh, here and making sure that they feel that they are, you know, fairly compensated compared to, you know, what a uh, recruiter might call them up and try and lure them away with. No offense. Sure. <laughs> Not taken. It's okay. No. <laughs> Absolutely. No, thank you, Matt. Uh, Laura, what's your, what's your thoughts on the compensation issue? I think it's just really heightened. Um, Matt, you didn't say it's a kind of a buyer's market, but it's an employee's market. Yeah. And I think employees have a choice. And I kind of mentioned this earlier. They're, they're look, they're looking at had my company fair during COVID, if we have another one or this goes on, is it going to be stable? I think stability is super important in addition to comp. I think if they don't want to go back to a hybrid work environment for a variety of reasons, and some could be you know, legitimate me medical reasons, maybe they are legitimately concerned. So I try to always assume the innocence there. They may be looking for a different type of employer that can accommodate mm -hmm. what is important to them. So I think what was important before and what is important now you know, has shifted a little bit for some people. Sure. And I think it's the whole package. I don't think it's just obviously base salary and bonus or ticket to play, but even when you get that right, there are other total rewards elements that people are considering. And I think the only thing Matt didn't mention that I'm seeing a lot of in our um, employees is flexibility. Mm -hmm. So we assume the hybrid work flexibility is there, but even beyond that, like mm -hmm. they, 
want to be able to work where they want to work when they want to work and that that realistic or unrealistic expectations around what flexibility looks like for them they sure. have been able to manage it fairly well in the last year and so i think that's a non-currency but it has a lot of value absolutely and so i think you know people are kind of weighing in on what is important beyond compensation mm -hmm. to you know keep some things that have been good in COVID, and there have been you know some some things that have come out positively as a result of where we're at today yeah, Laura, I think you're right. You know, employees are job seekers are clearly in the driver's seat more so than they've been, you know, in in years. Uh, and it's been an interesting, you know, compare and contrast for, you know, those of us who were, uh, you know, working through the great, you know, recession and the challenges that that brought, and kind of the opposite effect of, you know, how many times, how many people did you talk to that would say, well, you know, I don't love my job or my boss, but it's better to have a job than be out of work, you know, in, in this environment. This is, you know, the the complete opposite of that. And your point on, um, it, it's more than just pay. It's the other aspects of total rewards. And honestly, for the, the first time, you know, that I can recall, other than like trying to hire, you know, a safety professional, people mm -hmm. are asking about, you know, workplace safety. You know, I've had yeah. people ask me, you know, how many uh, of your employees have contracted COVID? you know, during the pandemic, you know, and when I'm able to say you know, something like, you know, about 14% of our entire workforce has contracted COVID and we've been able to prove through our safety practices and contact tracing that none of those infections actually occurred in the workplace, uh, mm -hmm. they occurred outside of work. Um, and we feel confident that, you know, what we, what we have done and continue to do will protect and has protected the, the health and safety of our employees. You know, that, that's a compelling message, but I'm not, you know, be, it, it, it's been pre-COVID, it would have felt unusual for somebody to ask, mm -hmm. you know, a, a workplace safety question like that mm -hmm. if they want to, sure. you know, interviewing for a safety job. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. I, I think that that data is so important to, to have, Matt, you know, to share with well, prospective candidates, right, at the end of the day. I mean, they, that's very, it's one thing to, to have any subjective, uh, you know, opinions on things, but when you, when you actually have that, that data, that's that's huge. So thanks for bringing that up. And it's this actually ties in really nice to a, a question that we do have um, from our audience that I wanted to bring up. And uh, Laura, this is for you. Um, are you going to be, are you going to ask for employees to turn in their negative test results? And if so, you know, who's collecting this? Is this HR? Is this safety? Um, Mm -hmm. Kind of curious of your thoughts. Yeah, we haven't implemented it yet, but um, we're kind of leaning in there because what's really happening, at least in our corporate environment, what we're seeing is it's it's almost causing workplace tension of the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. The vaccinated want to know: Are these unvaccinated people following the mask protocols? Are they being safe? I've done I've done my part. Are they doing their part? Mm -hmm. And and even within the unmasked, you kind of have two camps. You have those that can't or have deeply held religious beliefs, and then you have those who just are sure. not wanting to get it. And so what we're really trying to manage is how do we handle, you know, all of that together. Um, and, the, and the vaccinated folks are asking me, can you guarantee mm -hmm. that the unvaccinated people are being safe and not bringing it in? And, and so we haven't gone there yet, but if we go to asking for vaccination cards and weekly tests, yeah, HR will collect mm -hmm. that data. We'll keep it confidentially. If somebody needs the interactive process, all the ADA stuff um, that you guys are very familiar with. Um, if you're an HR on the call, if you're not, make sure you have you know your process. In fact, I've got my COVID policy right here that we, <laughs> we're, we're gonna roll out. But I think it's the only way to Matt's point that we can continue to say, we're doing everything we can to keep our workers safe. Mm -hmm. Up until now, we haven't mandated the vaccine. It's a choice for most, um, but yet what is the next level of safety that we can do? Mm -hmm. And so we're kind of leaning into that a little bit, but yeah, it's uh, you got to make sure you have all your ducks in a row yeah. as well. Absolutely. No, thank you for, for answering that, that question here. And one, um, one additional question I, I just, uh, and this could be for either one of you, if you want to jump in, you know, is what do you see is, is kind of the potential longer term strategy implications for the, for the, the talent shortage, right? I mean, we've been talking about a lot of things that are kind of happening in the now, right? But what about for anything that's a little bit more uh, longer term? At this point, yeah, Nick, I can I can take that. You know, one of the um, the things I was thinking about, you know, just in advance of, of this call, um, you know, on this topic is, you know, you've heard a lot about, um, you know, I think Laura, you even mentioned this earlier, people reevaluating, you know, their lives and their careers and what they do during COVID, and as a result of that, you know, you're seeing more people, you know, maybe change career fields, you know, or change industries. So if there is 
but that is a trend you know that continues and like we may need to be more open to looking at talent that maybe isn't exactly what we would have wanted to hire in the past you know if mm -hmm. i have i don't know uh like an fpna manager role you know open at corporate and in the past it's like i, I need you know, it's a requirement that that person have food experience Mm -hmm. Well, in the future, you know, I may need to be open to people coming from other industries who have the functional experience, but mm -hmm. maybe not um, either the depth or type of industry specific experience, you know, that I'm looking for. And I may need to find ways to, you know, help um, change either onboarding or training practices um, to help people, um, you know, enter an industry um, where they have the functional skills, but maybe not the the industry knowledge or experience. Sure. So I think we might see, you know, more of that in the in the future. That could be a longer term implication of this. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, perfect. Uh, you know, the only ahead, thing I, yeah, no, the only thing I might add is I think to Matt's point, just being being a little more agile on the requirements, also taking bigger risks with our current employees, and I sure. think. You know, I love to move people around. It makes my executives super nervous when I move a salesperson to marketing or marketing <laughs> to sales. And I'm like, look, they have a good track record. We know they have high performance. They, you know, have good potential. They're smart. They have high learning agility. Like, would we rather take a risk on a known entity that we also have a safety belt in place to pull them back or, sure. you know, adjust them back around than somebody from the outside that's unknown? And so I just think we're going to be, um, pushed isn't the right word, but we're going to have the luxury, let's say, sure. to be a little more agile, even inside, to take some bigger, bolder talent risks on our own people to to learn and grow in, in broader ways. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Um, you know, I want to be able to kind of wrap up here today to, uh, as we're closing in on, on time to see, um, you know, really, if there's Anything that you would like, any closing thoughts uh, that you'd like to share that maybe we haven't addressed today that you think would be, uh, you know, important that you wanted to relay to our, our audience at this time? Uh, Laura, maybe, would you want to start things off? Oh, gosh. I mean, I think, first <laughs> of all, I want to thank the community because we're all figuring this out together. You know, Absolutely. we don't have the right answers. There's no one size fits all. There's no silver, silver bullet. And so I just am so grateful for these type of events because when I go and I'm listening, you know, if I get one little nugget from Matt and I've picked up yep. several tips from Matt today that I was writing down earlier, we're all really all in this together. We're, mm -hmm. Even though we're competing for sometimes the same talent, I, I saw we have some retail folks on the on the call today mm -hmm. and um, we're all kind of competing against each other. And, and at the same time, I feel like never before have we been a community that we're just kind of going through this together and trying sure. to figure it out. Um, so I just want to say thank you. And we definitely don't have all the right answers. Most of it's we've skinned our knees on things and tried to pick ourselves up. Um, I do think transparency with the employees has been something that we've always had, but I think just continuing to be very transparent with them with where we're at today mm -hmm. so that they can plan and know, and there's no secret agenda, there's no hidden thing. And sometimes we just don't know. And we tell them, we just don't know. Mm -hmm. And I think that vulnerability as an executive for the first time really matters the most. Matt talked about the racial tension, vulnerability around that. Matt talked about, you know, the scarce skills and how we need to make tough choices to run the business and those investments, that transparency, I think more than ever, you know, I think historically we've kind of kept some of that stuff close to the vest. And I just sure. think I'm finding employees respond really well as transparent as you can be with them. And so I don't know if that's words of wisdom or, you know, at least learn from my scars on my knees, but I think <laughs> um, when they know they feel like they are a part of it and can make informed decisions also for themselves. And, and they'll give you that discretionary effort back. So. Absolutely. No, that's great. Thank you, Matt. Anything else you'd like to share? Yeah. Here, I think the, the closing thought I'd, I'd leave the, the group with is, you know, I often hear from, you know, employees or just acquaintances, friends, whomever, as you're talking about COVID, the question that's on people's mind is like, when is this going to end? Like, when will it be behind us? Mm -hmm. And everyone's kind of looking for that point where, you know, it's done and we move on. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think we're all hoping for that. But I think that the thing that is important to remember, uh, and I use, um, you know, a, a personal, you know, kind of anecdote to, to highlight the point I'm going to make. So I started my, I've been in HR for 20 years, but prior to that, I was, I did something completely different. I was a logistics officer in the army for a number of years. And, you know, I had been on, you know, deployments to hotspots in the world before. And when you're on a deployment, you know, every day is either, you know, it's generally, you know, mind numbing repetition uh, interspersed with moments of sheer terror. <laughs> and COVID in many ways has been like that, especially 
um, you know, early on. And then it, when you're on a deployment, you're waiting for like, when is this going to end and be done? But what I realized as a leader is there are things that you learn when you're on a deployment that you take back and you get better at. You change, mm -hmm. you train, you change how, you know, you utilize equipment, you change your organizational, you know, structure to adapt to the next point of tension that you're going to. Mm -hmm. I think those same lessons apply, you know, for COVID. So I think we've all learned how to be more agile, how to be more flexible, how to be more, you know, empathetic, how to be more responsive as leaders. And I hope that we don't lose those things, mm -hmm. you know, as COVID, uh, as our COVID deployment ends. You know, yep. at some point, because those are things that I think that all of us as leaders on this call, and I think that uh, the members of our respective organizations, we have all developed the uh, certain types of skill uh, from this COVID deployment, and we should look to continue to apply them in the future, and not just forget it when this is behind us at some point. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's... If, if Matt, I'm afraid, what if it doesn't, you know, what if the deployment never ends and this is the way of life? So I think, uh, yeah, <laughs> that was a big sigh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm <feeling Yeah>. like... <laughs> and, and, and Laura, you know, to that point, the, um, it, we will probably be living with some form of this for a while. And honestly, like if it's not COVID, it's, it's something else. I sure. mean, if, while none of us have, I think, lived through a global pandemic before to this extent, um, there are things that we have had to respond to and react to over the course of our career. So yeah. um, no one wishes to go through something like this, but there are things that we certainly get to take away from it mm -hmm. uh, that hopefully make us better as leaders. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And no, I think you both in summary and hit the nail on the head is as long as we're learning and improving right at the mm -hmm. end of the day. And I think that this, you know, this really has, um, you know, it causes us to do that, which is great. So um, I, I'd like to, to, to wrap up our session and, and, Thank you, Laura and Matt, uh, for an extremely you know engaging conversation uh, on a very you know trending and, and, and hot topic. Um, you know, at the end of the day, and and I really hope um and I know I, I know I have uh, that our, our audience really has some some great takeaways from this, right? So uh, I want to also thank everybody who joined our call today, uh, and I really at the end of the day want to look forward to seeing everybody uh, at future events. So. Uh, again, thank you to, to, to Matt and Laura, and uh, everybody have a, a great rest of the week and, and weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank Good you. Thank you. Be safe, everyone.